Good evening, and I would like to welcome you all to this online academy discourse, which is supported by the law firm of Mason Hayes and Curran LLP. For those of you who are not familiar with academy discourses, they are the oldest and most renowned series of talks in Ireland. The first discourses were presented in 1786, and historically, academy discourses were the occasion reserved for the most distinguished academics to first reveal and discuss their work in public. We hold six discourses each year, and in the past few years, we've had Nobel Prize winners, internationally distinguished political figures, senior European public servants, and of course, internationally eminent scholars, all of whom delivered a broad range of discourses, most of which are available on the Academy website. I am Mary Canning, I'm president of the Royal Irish Academy. Uh, also present this evening are the Academy Secretary, Professor Pat Shannon, the Academy Treasurer, Professor Stephen Gardner, and our Executive Director, Dr. Tony Gaynor. Before we begin, I just have one little bit of Academy business to undertake. The minutes of our last discourse by Professor Dame Jocelyn Ben Barnell on astronomy and poetry, which took place on the 10th of December 2020, were posted online. And as since no member informed us of any issue with these minutes, I will take these as approved and sign the minute book in Academy House when circumstances permit me to do so. So our event tonight serves a double purpose. Both what I expect to be a fascinating conversation between our special guests, Fintan O'Toole and William Crawley, and as the launch for the Academy New Aran Initiative. Aran means analyzing and researching Ireland, North and South. And this is a joint project led by the Royal Irish Academy and the Keonopton School for Irish Studies at the University of Notre Dame, although it would be Notre Dame in France, at the University of Notre Dame's Keo School of Global Affairs. I am delighted to welcome Professor Cathy Gormley Heenan to introduce this initiative. Good evening. My name is Professor Cathy Gormley Heenan, and as a member of the Aran Steering Committee and the Advisory Group, I am pleased to introduce the Aran's project. The title of the project Aran's is an acronym that stands for Analyzing and Researching Ireland North and South. It's a joint project of the Royal Irish Academy and the Kew Naughton Institute for Irish Studies at the University of Notre Dame's Kew School of global affairs. This new initiative is being launched against the backdrop of the United Kingdom's withdrawal from the European Union, which does provide an important opportunity to reflect on the current relationships on the island of Ireland and between Ireland and the UK. The founding partners have brought together leading experts from a range of sectors and academic disciplines across Ireland, North and South, England, Scotland and the US to consider a range of questions relating to the future of the North-South and the East-West relations. Our aim is to provide an authoritative, independent and non-partisan analysis and research on constitutional, institutional and policy options for Ireland, North and South, following the departure of the UK from the European Union. Looking ahead to the future challenges, project partners seek to address questions on constitutional and institutional issues, as well as fiscal, social and environmental topics. Now, this project is not pro or anti-unification. Our aim is simply to avoid the information vacuum that occurred in the UK at the time of the Brexit referendum. If a referendum on a border poll were to arise, what questions will the electorate on both sides of the border have? And regardless of the constitutional futures of these jurisdictions, the current trends in public discourse already provide an opportunity to assess North-South interdependencies and cooperation in a whole range of areas. 
Our research and our analysis will focus on three broad areas. Firstly, the political, the constitutional and the legal questions. Secondly, the economic, financial, social and environmental questions. And thirdly, the cultural and educational questions. We've already begun commissioning research from scholars in all relevant disciplines. And in publishing and publicizing that research, we will seek to support respectful debate among politicians, within the media and civil society, and among the general public. So I'm really pleased to announce the publication of our first papers in Irish Studies and International Affairs, edited by Professor John Doy. These first papers, with responses by peer academics, include Cross-Border Cooperation in Health and Ireland by Deirdre Heenan from Ulster University, Unionism, Identity and Irish Unity, the Paradigms, Problems and Paradoxes by Jennifer Todd from UCD, Getting Ready, the Need to Prepare for a Referendum on Reunification by Brendan O'Leary from the University of Pennsylvania, and the Good Friday Agreement and a United Ireland by Rory Montgomery, former Irish diplomat from Queen's University Belfast and Trinity College Dublin. Who is Better Off? Measuring Cross-Border Differences in Living Standards by Seamus McGuinness, Adele Bergen and Alan Barrett from Esri completes our first set of papers. This is a wide ranging and inclusive project and we really welcome journal submissions from scholars in all relevant fields. We're seeking scholars to contribute to journal articles, to respond to our papers, to write blog posts, and we welcome collaborations with both academics and industry partners. So find out more and read all of our research at aronsproject.com. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gormley Heenan. This is a timely and important initiative, and I look forward to following its progress closely. So now to our special guests for tonight's discourse on Northern Ireland after Brexit. Fintan Hotul, who needs very little introduction in Ireland, certainly, is a columnist with the Irish Times. He is also the Leonard L. Milberg Visiting Lecturer in Irish Letters at Princeton University. And he is a regular contributor to the New York Review of Books, which makes him famous in America too. Certainly, I greatly enjoy reading his articles. He has won both the Orwell Prize for Journalism and the European Press Prize. His most recent book is The Politics of Pain, Post-War England and the Rise of Nationalism, published by Liberize. And he is working on the official biography of Seamus Heaney. Fintan was elected to membership of the Royal Irish Academy in 2020. And I look forward to meeting him eventually when circumstances permit. William Crawley is a journalist and broadcaster with the BBC presenting television and radio programmes on subjects as varied as news and politics, arts and science, religion and ethics. He hosts the daily radio current affairs programme, Talkback, for the BBC in Northern Ireland, Sunday on BBC Radio 4, a uh, personal favourite of mine, and he regularly writes and presents documentaries for Radio 3, Radio 4, the BBC World Service. He was elected to membership of the Royal Irish Academy in 2019. Following the conversation between Fenton and William, we will have the opportunity for some questions from our audience, and they will be facilitated by the Academy's Senior Vice President, Jerry McKenna. If you wish to ask a question, please use the Zoom Q&A function, and we hope to have time to answer as many as we can. So we now turn to the discourse, and Fintan and William, over to you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, <clears throat> what, a, what a pleasure it is to be able to do this. Um, I'm, pretty, uh, I'm pretty delighted to be able to do it with William, um, who's an absolutely brilliant broadcaster and, and someone I've admired hugely for years um, and who plays the role that a public intellectual and a broadcaster should play which is of holding open <clears throat> the arena for for rational discourse and, and, and for um, respectful dialogue and he does it on a daily basis <laughs> and it's that's enormously admirable um, 
William, could, could I maybe just ask you to begin by giving us a sort of tour of the horizon um, of mm. what does Northern Ireland look like after Brexit? Fenton, thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted and honoured as always uh, to be with you. We were just recalling earlier, you didn't know me at this point, but I first met you back in the mid-90s when you signed a copy of your Sheridan book for me at the Abbey Theatre. And, and I've been reading you avidly ever since. So it's a delight to be talking with you, one of our, our great thinkers and, and journalists um, here and I think internationally. Look, on this day a year ago, uh, we were kind of filled with optimism, weren't we, in Northern Ireland? Because on this very day, we had the New Decade New Approach document, which presaged uh, the return of government after a three-year hiatus. And then COVID came very quickly after that. So a year that was really probably going to be focused on Brexit issues became dominated, understandably, by the coronavirus pandemic. And I suppose that's true also of Europe, and it's true of Ireland, and it's true of Great Britain as well, and the Westminster government's approach. Brexit negotiations continued. What was planned, what was expected to be an implementation period or a transition really amounted to continued extended negotiations until the very last minute, the very last minute. And then we were uh, into a deal, which was a surprise to some people, not so much a surprise near the end, and a deal that has left many people confused, uh, which is why our programmes and our coverage here in recent days has been dominated by images of empty shelves in supermarkets, so members of the public complaining about the inability to supply, uh, to, to arrange supplies, perhaps even simply to order things and have them delivered on Amazon. Some of that's been seen in GB as well, incidentally, and I just saw some images today of the Marks and Spencer supermarkets in, uh, in Paris. So it's not simply a Northern Ireland issue for sure. But then we try to explain what's going on because we have a Northern Ireland protocol and the Northern Ireland protocol as everybody must know by this point, means that Northern Ireland remains within the European Union's single market for goods. And that means that we have bureaucracy on the way in from goods coming from GB into Northern Ireland, because that is the route into the single market for goods. And the blame game, in a sense, has begun politically around this. Uh, the DUP maintained that was they were opposed to the Northern Ireland Protocol, they, they didn't want it, they don't want it. They did support the first iteration of it, which would have uh, brought in some kind of protocol arrangement, but with consent from the Assembly in advance. We now have uh, another iteration which they have opposed, uh, which means that we, we have this arrangement, and then in four years' time, the Assembly will be asked to confirm it with consent. And the, the DUP has actually been suggesting that the protocol is the responsibility of the, of the Remain parties um, who wanted to avoid, avoid a border on the island of Ireland so much that we end up with this situation. The Remain parties, of course, are saying you can't possibly blame Remain parties for the implications of Brexit, given that they oppose Brexit throughout. And in the midst of all of that, we have a Secretary of State, Brandon Lewis, who, and it's very difficult to understand his reasoning here, denies that there is an Irish sea border, even though we clearly have a border for regulation, for customs, for VAT checks, and we have legislation in place um, with the British government, published very recently, describing the border control posts, that's the language in the legislation, and we can see them with our very eyes. <laughs> we can see them with our very eyes. So when I interviewed them recently, I, I described this as a sort of Trumpian, analysis, uh, because you're asking, you, know, you could have said Chemical Alley, really, couldn't you? You're asking us to deny what is before our very eyes. So we have an agreement amongst all of our political parties, notwithstanding the Secretary of State's comments, that we do have uh, this trade arrangement, this border post arrangement, and uh, the future will be shaped by what we do about it. The DUP's approach will be to try to mitigate disruptions caused by this or affected by all of the new bureauc bureaucracy. And it'll be interesting to see what the Remain parties do to build on this situation, because this clearly is a marker. Um, this is an inflection point in our politics 
uh, which could determine how our politics progresses uh, from this point onwards. Uh, I don't know what it would have been like, this disruption, had there not been COVID. Maybe COVID has disguised some of the additional disruption we might have seen. Maybe it has. I don't know. Um, it's a counterfactual. But we, ha but we have a situation where we have some level of disruption, which may be caused by suppliers simply not understanding the bureaucracy required of them. And it was brought in very quickly. Uh, my colleague, John Campbell, our BBC economics editor, used a wonderful analogy. He said it's like a major company deciding to completely uh, revamp and reintroduce a new IT system over Christmas and sending you an email while you're on your Christmas break saying, when you come back to work on Monday, it'll be up and operative. Good luck with it. So there's lots of confusion. That's where we are. <clears throat> yeah, it, 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 it strikes me that... Um... You know, we'd be wasting our time trying to engage in a blame game, and that's not probably the, the, the function of this discourse yeah. anyway. Um, but what is relevant, I think, is, is not so much, okay, it was your fault, it was your fault. It's yeah. nobody planned this. So, so when we're thinking about the state of Northern Ireland as it lies post-Brexit, we're talking about the law of unintended consequences. Mm. We're talking about something that nobody really wanted, nobody thought was a good idea. <laughs> um, from very early on in the Brexit process, I found myself quoting a lot the, you know, Sherlock Holmes' uh, answer to Dr. Watson last, but how do you solve a particularly difficult crime? And, you know, where, where Holmes says, well, you eliminate the impossible and whatever remains, <laughs> however improbable, <laughs> must be the solution <laughs> and the, however improbable is where northern ireland ended up right mm -hmm. so it's a it's a highly improbable outcome but this has consequences of course it has the consequences you've been so eloquently describing at the immediate term you know which is the, uh, quite understandably nobody quite knows how this thing is going is supposed to work one can assume let's let's you know be optimistic and say okay those are the sorts of things that however awkward do get ironed out mm. over time. You know, yeah. Businesses are very good ultimately at working out, you know, if we want to make some profit, this is the way we've got to do it. <laughs> so 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 let's assume that the the systems start working at some point. Mm. But we're still left with with the political consequences, which are which are ones that um are, are really seem to me the more the more I kind of try to get my head around them seem seem more imponderable and more extraordinary. Um, the, the process of elimination was simply was twofold, you know. So the Irish government reacted very decisively, very quickly, and I think very competently actually to the Brexit threat even before the referendum. I mean, they were talking to their partners in Europe about, you know, pinning them to the wall and saying, if this happens, this is the consequence for Northern Ireland, and this is what we want you to be on board with, which is saying there was no hard border. So it, you, you had a very, very clear-minded and very um, well thought through and well executed strategy on the part of the Irish government, and you'd almost no strategy at all on the part of the British government. Right? So, so uh, it, you, you, the only thing you had was the magical technology. You had Boris Johnson telling people that the border in Northern Ireland was really no different from um, the, 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 um, the passing from one zone in London, one borough of London into another one. You know, you had all this kind of rather extraordinary evidence that really there, there had been no serious thought given to any of these consequences. Mm. So w whether you think the Irish government was right or wrong, or, you know, and of course people will have very different views about that in other hands. The fact is that you had, you had one agenda, which was, which was very competently and clearly pursued uh, and you had another which was completely reactive to that. It was completely saying, oh, it's not a problem at all, really. It will go away with the technology. And then you had, you, we've now had, we have two successive British Prime Ministers saying, this, the idea of Northern Ireland having a different Brexit to the rest of the UK is something mm -hmm. no British Prime Minister could ever agree to. Yeah. <laughs> and and <clears throat> it's where, we, where we've ended up. Yeah. So it, it, that, that's the basic problem, isn't it? it? It's it's that 
everybody's being forced into trying to deal with and cope with a situation <clears throat> uh, that, that really has only come about through people saying what they don't want rather than what they do. And the consequence politically here, and this will be an issue in our politics, of course it will be, is that Northern Ireland, because it remains in the European Union's single market for goods, remains under remains subject to the rules of the European single market for goods. And the U United Kingdom, having left the European Union, uh, has no say in shaping those rules. But the Irish government does have a say in shaping those rules. And so in terms of that trade connection, the Irish government has more influence uh, over that aspect of Northern Irish affairs than the London government or indeed the Stormont Assembly. Uh, and that is a difficult one to process uh, within unionism. Yes, I, I, I mean, it's, it seems to me to be absolutely understandable why it would be so different to, to, to yeah. sort of this process because, you know, we've talked about the democratic deficit and, and, and there is one, you know, in a way you could technically say, well, Ireland's only one of 27 EU governments, you know, it's not, but, but what this process has shown, which is again, is something rather new from a Southern perspective is that actually Ireland can have enormous influence on European Union policy <clears throat> as it relates to Northern Ireland. Right? So <clears throat> one of the ironies, it seems to me, of, of, of the last four years is that if you look at it historically in terms of the peace process and all that, the European Union has been a kind of benign bystander, right? You know, obviously very supportive of the peace process, very um, anxious to see this embarrassment within the European Union uh, cleaned up, but but not a big player. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't a player in the way that the Irish government, the British government, or even the US yeah. government was. So one of the odd things, and again, if I was a unionist, I would be quite alarmed by this, is that actually the European Union became quite proprietorial about Northern Ireland. And I, I remember a year after the Brexit referendum, um, listening to Heiko Maas, the German foreign minister in mm. Dublin, speaking to the assembled Irish diplomatic corps saying the Northern Ireland peace process is a German national interest. <laughs> it's not, you know, it's not something that we're just kind of abstracting. In. <clears throat> we're interested in it as part of the peace process, which is part of the peace project rather, which is the European Union, which is yeah. a German national interest. And therefore we see this as, as now part of our identity. <clears throat> He actually used the word, you know, our identity is tied up with the Northern Ireland Peace Process. That was unimaginable five years ago. And so this, again, is not something that was particularly intended, but it does seem to me to mm. have huge long-term consequences that the EU is almost moving towards a state of mind in which Northern Ireland is a kind of EU protectorate. Does that make sense from what you think? Yes. And I, I mean, I think historically it'll, it will, will, there will be this critique that one of the difficulties that some on, on, on the British negotiation side had was understanding Ireland's relationship to the European Union, as if you could somehow separate the two as part of the negotiation. Uh, and the consequence of what you've just described in terms of um, a European perspective on, on Northern Ireland will look to unionism um, and, and has been described in such terms as a form of annexation, economic annexation of Northern Ireland from the rest of the United Kingdom. And obviously that's pretty strong language, but that's very strongly felt within the unionist community, or much, much of it within Northern Ireland. The question I have really is, is you know, we, we'll hopefully be able to mitigate some of, of the difficulties in terms of disruption uh, and the flow of trade. How will this change our politics? I mean, for example, one of the ways in which we might find solutions um, to trade flows and, and supply uh, will be uh, s sourcing products in the Republic rather than in GB. Just one of them. It's not easy to do that quickly, but that's just one of them. If that happens over time, um, if you, if over time you have a more economically connected island, uh, the political ramifications of that could be enormous. Yes, I, I, I entirely agree with that. You know, because we're in the context, of course, of the centenary, and we'll probably talk about the centenary of Northern Ireland, but. You know, from whatever perspective you look at the, that partition, you know, the, 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 there's there's no doubt as well as the sectarian religious divide, the economic divide was was huge. I mean, mm. it was a, a, a 
vast gulf really between a largely agrarian south and a, and a, and a highly you know leading edge industrialized north um now we know that's been eroding anyway and and mm. so has uh, reversed itself but uh the the possibility of this sort of dynamic towards economic integration um, seems to be very powerful. Just at a very simple level, um, you know, it is remarkable how fast things can, can move. So mm. uh, the, the, the trade, the goods trade between Ireland and the continental Europe, you know, has almost all of it was going through the land bridge, going through the UK. So in, in a way, if you were exporting from Dublin, you were doing the same thing you were doing if, if you were exporting from, from, from Larne. Um, now, suddenly, because of the problems at Dover, Danish um, ferry companies moving in and saying, actually, we can give you, you know, direct ferry connections from the mm -hmm. south of Ireland to Spain, to France. You know, you can, you can really build a yeah. whole new transport system. And just at a very simple level, if you're a business on the northern side of the of the border, it, it might start making a lot more sense to start thinking about, you know, I can actually avoid all this hassle. Um, and I'm free to take my goods down to Ross Lair and, and get them straight to, to France from there. And, you, you know, that just those, those mm -hmm. very simple, practical, boring things have long-term consequences, don't they, in terms of that idea of an economic mm -hmm. integration on the island. Indeed, they have the same kind of, in economic terms, they have the same <clears throat> kind of consequences you might see in terms of linguistic progression historically, but much, much faster. Yeah. Uh, and this brings us really to another issue, which is the reanimation of the referendum conversation that's happened throughout the whole Brexit um, journey over the past four years and the potential of a border poll. And of course, um, that's an issue in Scotland these days. There will be elections we think, in, in May, unless coronavirus puts paid to that. But that we, what, what's going to happen with those new elections in Scotland and the potential for mounting uh, um, momentum around a referendum there? Could that have implications here? And, and even without that, what are the implications of Brexit as it's unfolding, or they, some have described it as a half of Brexit in, in Northern Ireland, in terms of um, the, the future of our politics? Because those remain parties can unlike Keir Starmer, who probably for understanding st understandable strategic reasons doesn't want to have a, a Remain conversation anymore. Uh, he's got these North of England traditional Labour constituencies he wants to win back. Um, but the Remain parties in Northern Ireland certainly do want to have a Remain conversation in the future. And some of them say very clearly there's a way back in. And that is through a border poll successfully um, produced. And yet we have others who, who say, no, we, we, uh, we've had this decision. It's been taken as a UK-wide decision. We, we've got to move on with that decision. So we, we've got this different kind of parallel track approach to politics, very divided in terms of unionism, um, the DUP particularly as the principal Brexit party throughout the campaign. Uh, I don't know where that's going to go, but I have seen a quickening up of the momentum of the conversation. I have seen in my lifetime a quickening up in terms of the connections, and certainly since the Good Friday Agreement, the connect connectivity of the island. Um, I, I I look at broadcasting, for example, and in my childhood, I didn't even know who was, apart from Gay Byrne, I didn't really know who was broadcasting in the Republic. That, that has changed. The cultural border has lowered considerably on the island, and the broadcasting and journalistic border has too. So is that where we're going? Is that where we're going towards some kind of border poll conversation taking grip and gathering momentum further with unionism resisting and not wanting to be part of the conversation because for understandable reasons, even to be part of that conversation could add more momentum to the conversation, which might make it more likely. Yeah, you know, it, it, it seems to me the great political challenge for everybody in a way is, is, is exactly you know, the one you, you frame so well, which is, how do you have a conversation which 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 does not assume the end point? <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. I mean, I can absolutely understand if you're a unionist, you're going to say, "Hold on a minute, you you know, yeah, you're all talking about a very nice open conversation. Yeah, we know exactly what you think the end point is. Mm -hmm. so, so your conversation is how do we persuade you to get there? Uh, uh, and that seems to me to be 
sterile and unproductive, to put it mildly, um, particularly in a situation where people are deeply unsettled. Um, you couldn't and wouldn't say this as, a, as, a, as an objective BBC journalist, but maybe I can say it. Um, I think there's a huge crisis of leadership on the, on the unionist side, you know, uh, and I think Brexit has, has really brought it to the fore. Um, I don't think it would be harsh to say that the DUP has has led its its constituency, its supporters, into a situation which, if nationalists had proposed it, the DUP would have said, "This is absolutely outrageous." You know, you, you've created not just a separation between Northern Ireland and the UK, but you've created a separation which is dynamic. Yeah. In and of its nature, you know. So, so yes, the, the fact that there's been a deal does mean that the level of alignment, maybe at least in the short term, is going to remain quite strong in in terms in, re, in reality. You know, in terms of the, the operation of EU uh, type regulations of the common playing field and all of that kind of stuff. But nevertheless, the whole point of Brexit is to, you know, over time to depart from EU norms. And Northern Ireland is stuck with those norms. And it's not just stuck with them, but of course, we'll also mm. be <clears throat> dynamically mm -hmm. aligned to whatever Brussels is doing. And these are not abstract things. These are, you know, some of the most important questions that are facing humanity, like climate change. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, so they're, they're, they're things that really matter to people's lives. So if I were a unionist and, and I was looking at my future, I would be very worried, not just about the direction of change, but also mm. about whether, do I have a political leadership which, which has shown an ability to be able to influence successfully, mm. from my point of view, mm -hmm. what that direction of change is. Uh, and so that makes the conversation more difficult, doesn't it, in the sense that yeah. you, you have to have the conversation with somebody, and it's not clear who on the unionist side has been able to really fully think through what the implications of the situation that certainly the DUP helps to create might be. And the DUP is very easily stereotyped, incidentally. Uh, but, but the DUP has, within its ranks and within its political ranks, um, very impressive strategic thinkers uh, and very bright analysts about some of the policy around this. Of course, you have to be uh, a, a party unified with one position when you're in public and you have those private discussions in private. Um, but from time to time, Peter Robinson, the former DUP leader, will give a, an, an honorary professor, professorial lecture at Queen's or somewhere else in which he does more than hint that he would like to see uh, a different kind of, not a different leader, but a different kind of direction sometimes within the public leadership um, strategy of the DUP. For example, on these questions of, of border polls, um, Peter Robinson is clearly encouraging a more thoughtful conversation in public about making the case for a United Kingdom and Northern Ireland's place within it and, and the economic benefits as well as the cultural identity issues around all of that as well. But there's nervousness about making that case because it might add momentum to the very debate that you don't want to have um, if you're a if you are a, a DUP politician. So that can, that can lead to an avoidance of, of some of the issues, and 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 can lead to you being sort of seen as um, a wall when a political debate is happening around you. But I can fully understand why they're nervous about that debate, and they're nervous about the terms of the debate as well, because DUP politicians will be criticized for saying i'm a unionist that's the position that's my a priori position by the way that's where i'm trying to get to people will say sometimes well that's not very open-minded shouldn't you look at the economic arguments and come to a decision at the end of the argument rather than at the beginning with your premises um think it's through and say well i mean the economic arguments are strong let's go for a united ireland a unionist isn't going to say that but the unionist will say well, look at some people on the Republican side. Your a priori position is a united Ireland is the position you're trying to get to. Are you seriously open to the economic arguments for 
retaining the union with the United Kingdom? Are you seriously open to that? Or have you made your mind up as well? And it becomes an ideological a priori boxing match. So the, the, the thing that really kind of struck me about this whole process over the last five, six years has been the lack of preparation by, by everybody. You know? So um, I don't think there was any serious preparation at all on the Brexit here side for, for what the implications for the union in general, not just for Northern Ireland, but for the actual existence mm. of the union states might be. Um, there was some preparation on the, the Irish government side, I think, in the months running up to the referendum and, and then it kicked in very fast afterwards. But it was very focused on the border question, mm. Mm. and quite recently, I think you know that, that wasn't the time to start thinking about you know what does right. it look like in twenty thirty. You know, yeah, it, it was felt to be a sort of an emergency situation. And one explanation for that, Fintan, may be simply they didn't expect to win. Of course, uh, you know, I I, I I think that's obvious, isn't it? That really, that this was yeah, um, you know, I think it was a kind of um, holiday mm -hmm. from. The boring business of consensus politics in Northern Ireland, having to deal with Sinn Féin and all that, and you know you could get out and wave the flag and feel good about Britishness, and and it wouldn't have consequences. And of course, it, it has these consequences. But w w where it leaves us is that the the only big solution on the table, right, is the one which is there and legitimised by the Belfast Agreement, which is a border poll leading to mm -hmm. Northern Ireland. Yeah. And I wonder, is that not itself problematic, right? Which is, well, it's problematic, first of all, in, in procedural terms, right? That, that, that it's, it's actually one of the pieces of the Belfast Agreement that I think anybody looking at it objectively would say, this is pretty badly thought through, and pretty badly drafted, you know, <laughs> because it, it, it gives no indication at all of, of, of what is the process. I mean, you know, it, it says that it's a Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, but effectively, who, who decides whether to have a border. Mm -hmm. And it gives it sets down no real criteria. I mean, you know, not not in any yeah. visible way as to how she or he should make that decision. And I imagine that the, the reason that was framed like that was simply that you know the, the, the larger of Belfast Agreement was that it should have been a joint decision by the British and Irish governments, maybe in, including the assembly or you know some kind of larger structure. But I, uh, that was obviously unacceptable at the time to unionism, and, and probably mm. the Belfast Agreement wouldn't have wouldn't have passed if that if that had been the case. But it leaves us with what looks like a single so possible solution on the table, but one that actually, in in infrastructural terms, in terms of the the, the process and, and how this should happen, mm -hmm. but also in terms of what does United Ireland mean. It, 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 it's it's actually quite vague. And one important thing here is that uh, as part of the process, of course, the, 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 the Republic changed its constitution, got rid of the, the, the claim on Northern Ireland, but replaced it with a formula that, that actually doesn't really look very much like a monolithic United Ireland. I mean, it's about, um, you know, the, 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 the uniting in harmony and friendship of, uh, the people who share the territory of the island of Ireland in all the diversity of their their identities and traditions. You know, it's a very very pluralistic formulation from, if you like, Irish nationalism. I mean, this was voted for by over ninety percent of the population or the, well, the voting population of the south. So, mm -hmm. so Irish nationalism has actually reframed itself officially into actually a very subtle, open, pluralistic version of what it's. Its, its aim is, but the version as contained in the Belfast Agreement is actually you know, border poll. So, so it's, it, it seems to bring down all of that um, subtlety and complexity and openness into a sort of single decision. And one of the things we know from the Brexit experience is that bad referendums have bad consequences. And I don't mean that to mean that people in Britain didn't have a right to vote, you know, in the UK didn't have a right to vote, but it was a bad referendum in terms of the framing of what does this mean? The, the yes, no question w w was not an adequate um, mm -hmm. proposition you know, in terms yeah. of the sheer complexity of what Brexit might be. And then we, we know the consequences of that have been, have been a mess and one that will not be 
solved easily. It's not going to, it's not going to go mm. away. So, you know, the, the, the danger from a nationalist perspective is, is that you end up with a yes, no question, which comes in very heavily on top of a process mm-hmm. that was meant to be getting rid of exactly those binaries and coming up with something much more complex. Right. Contrast that with what, what they did in Scotland, the last referendum. I think I've got it in this room, actually. Uh, a copy published by uh, the book published by, and it is a, a massive tome published by the Scottish government, laying out chapter by chapter what yeah. what it would mean if you vote yes or vote for Scottish independence. Even a chapter in there, what would the BBC be? You know, the, the replacement of that with a Scottish Broadcasting it's 900 Corporation. Nine hundred pages, isn't it? I mean, yes, it's an enormous tome. Yeah. I mean, they worked through all of that. Yeah. But then there are there are others who are saying, well, you know, you've had some some significant work done in the Arachis around this with uh, equally large tomes looking at um, all aspects of what that could mean. Um, It's still not sufficient in many of the practical questions people are asking about healthcare, education, pensions, civil service, um, what all of that means. Um, So I think that would be a a danger for any border policy say that if you don't know what the answer means, it's very easy to give an answer, but if you don't know what it means in terms of it playing out, uh, then you're going to end up uh, in this complex situation we find ourselves in now, where even though we've had Brexit, I can still uh, introduce you to people who supported the campaign for Brexit, who say this is not Brexit. What we've got now is not is not Brexit because there was always that lack of clarity. I mean, another aspect that feeds into this in a way is that, that I suppose on both parts of the island we we share a certain solipsism. You know, we we, we, we think. <laughs> that the world should function the way we think it does. Um, part of the shock of Brexit really is that actually, you know, Ireland's north or south really didn't matter. You know, it, it was this, this huge event for mm. these islands w- with enormous consequences for, 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 for Northern Ireland, obviously, as part of the UK, but also for the Republic. Um, and really, you know, Two percent of the mind of the Brexiteers at most was devoted, mm. if, if if even that. Uh, and so, I wonder if if there's a thing n- neither side has really taken completely on board, which is that actually one of the reasons why we really do need to have a serious dialogue about this is that we're not in control of the events which might lead us towards. A crisis. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you know, there, there's always been an assumption somehow that the United Ireland narrative was 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 about you know what different brands of Irishness on the island might end up agreeing, yeah. um, and the British government would be just hands off and say, okay, you know, whatever you want is fine. But this isn't our movie, it, it, you, you know, um, and I, I I wonder from your experience of the of opinion very broadly i know you 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 get it all the time but how does the scottish question feed into this because that's another the brexit you know carried on without thinking about ireland the scots reasonably enough um if if nicola sturgeon wins her mandate to for a referendum mm-hmm. doesn't mean there's going to be one Our yeah. of course will say that there that there shouldn't be and he won't allow it but there's a there's an inbuilt dynamic towards a second referendum, it seems to me, over the next few years. And th- again, that's not going to be one in which Scotland's relationship to Northern Ireland is going to feature very heavily. No. So h- how does that play into the way in which unionists in particular, uh, you know, and particularly from the Presbyterian tradition, have very, very strong Mm-hmm. relationships with with scotland religiously culturally socially educationally all those things I mean, how, surely that must also be something that would would make you think this is something we really need to be yeah for. separate issue but the irish presbyterian church's relationship with the church of scotland has been fractured in recent years of course and they've they've broken off their kind of constitutional link with their with their mother church over same sex marriage and other kinds of issues, cultural issues. Um, uh, but, it, you know, this is, this is a difficult one because it's very easy to do an opinion poll uh, amongst unionists, for example, and say if Scotland were to get a referendum and were to vote 
for independence, would that affect your attitude to the United Kingdom? Uh, and would it even be the United Kingdom at that point? And, and many unionists will say, no, that that's an issue for them. This is an issue for, for us. But that's hypothetical. What happens when you put a date in the diary with a border poll? It can change the psychology of everything. Uh, and it can change the way people approach a question because it's no, it's no longer simply a hypothetical or an academic or a seminar question. It's, it's a life question. It's an existential question. And that can change everything. We saw it in Scotland. We saw it in Scotland. We saw how the opinion polls changed when they put a date in the diary for a referendum. So I don't know how that will go in Scotland. Boris Johnson, as you say, is fully opposed to, to doing that. It would be the first time he reversed position on something he was fully opposed to. He used to be fully opposed to uh, what we now have as a Northern Ireland Protocol <laughs> arrangement. So who knows how that will go? Um, I, I'm not sure when it will happen in terms of the, the movement of the Scottish question. We'll see some incremental movement, I suppose, this year after the May election when we see how that plays out, if it plays out in the way that Nicola Sturgeon wishes. Um, but those within the nationalist side will, will, will take, I'm sure, momentum from that move. I mean, you, you saw a change in the, the language, didn't you, of the SDLP leader, Colin Eastwood, uh, when, when he said the United Kingdom is coming to an end, essentially. And that's a very different kind of language from from Colm Eastwood. I mean, he may have always believed that, but to voice that uh, in the way that he did is quite significant. And it may, it may represent some of the changes that you're seeing in the Republic as well, with the rise of Sinn Féin as a very significant political party. That is having an effect on the rhetoric and the policies of the other two big parties in the South. Uh, so that will have an effect that comes back. Um, it's a dynamic relationship, as you said. It'll have an effect also north of the border. Another of the ironies here is that if 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 I were a unionist, you know, I could say that a lot tonight. So role role playing here, but <laughs> if if I if I was in an oppositional relationship to Sinn Fein, if I was the DUP or if I was the UUP or if I you know if I was mm. see, seeing the future of Northern Ireland as a contest between me and Sinn Fein, yeah. one of the things I would be thinking I really ought to do is get into dialogue with the Irish government now. Right, because Neil Martin has put forward a sort of the the shared island idea, and he's he's picking up the language of the yep. right, the, the amended Irish Constitution, and is in a way desperately in need of a partner to act as a counterweight to Sinn Fein's sort of rather monolithic view of this, right, which is border poll. 50% plus one, that's fine, that's mm. it, it's over. Mm. The, the shared island approach is one which obviously pushes much more towards a consensual, um, open, more complex, ambiguous set of relationships, uh, which might or might not end up being called the United Ireland. Um, strategically, it would seem to me to be much smarter for for unionists who are in competition with Sinn Féin in Northern Ireland to actually grasp the hand that's been mm. extended, mm -hmm. not least um, as a way of, of diminishing the influence of Sinn Féin over this discourse, because within nationalism, there is not at the moment a fully coherent alternative nationalist discourse to Sinn Féin's. It, it, the Irish government seems to be trying to create that through the, the sort of shared island idea, but it doesn't have the necessary partners to engage in that in that dialogue. Does that wash at all? Do you think with 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 unionists in Northern Ireland? I don't. I don't think you get anyone turning up. Yes, I don't think you would, uh, for those very same reasons that that have prevented engagement so far, because that would be seen as adding to the momentum of that border poll. Um, it's not inevitable, but it could help to make it more inevitable, more likely by adding to the momentum. So I, I doubt you're going to see it, actually. Um, could be wrong. I mean, there, there has been a unionist in the, in the Senate um, who is, is open to conversation, a liberal unionist in the Senate. But then some unionists in, in Northern Ireland have, have rejected his unionism. Um, because of some of the things that he's saying that are um, perhaps more sort of hermetically less sealed, let's put it that way. 
uh, to to the options in the Republic. So th- there you have that. I mean, I, I I think we're going to see more boomerang politics with what with these dynamic changes that are happening in the Republic, with Sinn Fein disrupting the politics as they've done because of their electoral success, and as things happen there, that will have an effect uh, north of the border. Uh, and similarly, how things play out north of the border through the avenue of Sinn Féin, of course, which is the great link in terms of political parties, north and south of the border, you'll have that continuing kind of dynamic move. Uh, and it'll be an incremental thing. I'm I'm not sure if we'll see a border poll in five years or 10 years. Who knows? I mean, I don't have a, a crystal ball. But I do remember speaking to a Scottish nationalist um, 20 odd years ago who said that the, who told me at the time, you know, the sensible strategy, he said, he got an A4 piece of paper, is to write down on a bit of paper everything that adds up to independence for Scotland. Everything practically that you mean by independence and then work on them incrementally until you've got 95% and then push for an independence referendum. And if you look at what the... Scottish Nationalist Party have, have done, actually. They have done lots and lots of incremental changes of that kind to move to that to that eventual poll. So if you were going by the Scottish model, it may be, I don't know historically how this will play out, but it may be that that incremental stitching together approach could be more successful than going straight to the electoral border poll approach and then trying to work it out afterwards. Yeah. I think that strikes me in all of this is that... Um, there's, there's, there are t- almost two dialogues uh, necessary. You know, um, one is the dialogue about the future of Northern Ireland, and the other, which is a very related, obviously, um, dialogue, but it's about the nature of mm. radicalism. You know? mm-hmm. um, there's been a sort of an odd process, really, whereby in my lifetime, you know, I, yeah. I, I've gone through at least four different phases. You know, so if you were born in 1958, as I was in you grew up in the 1960s before the troubles Irish nationalism was very very simple you know it was the Brits took our lands and we wanted back you know and and um, it was like, it was very explicitly Catholic um, sectarian uh, had this this kind of odd internal contradiction that Protestants were us um, and they were heretics, <laughs> so it was you know it was a double thing. <laughs> they're 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 really Irish, but but well, they're, they're they're not quite really the proper sort of. <laughs> um, so it was a very crude, simplistic, and, mm. and innately aggressive kind of nationalism, I suppose. Mm-hmm. The troubles then brought this long period of of effective mm. withdrawal, you know. Uh, not, of course, by everybody, and very significant, um, you know, old-style old, old nationalist discourse still, still remains, but clearly for the majority of people in the South, the, the North was trouble, and uh, that the main aim was to make sure that trouble did not migrate southwards, you know, mm-hmm. the southern state could protect itself, not, not in a way unreasonably, it may not be the most um, admirable and noble of, of, um, of gestures, but, you know, Self-preservation is, a, is is pretty well built into most states, uh, and then the third phase was sort of peace process. You know, let's let's get reconciliation, be pluralistic, and and then you've had a kind of fourth phase, which has sort of crept up, which is a kind of re uh, readmittance of the sort of nationalist imperative. It's come through the centenary process, mm-hmm. you know. It's, but it's it's quite unsure of itself actually, and it's quite unsure how, how does that bit go with the third phase? How does that go with all mm. the peace process stuff? How how does the, you know what what how do you articulate a, a nationalist agenda mm. which takes on board all of the things that were sort of learned in the previous phases uh, and. One of the things that hasn't really been fully articulated about this is the possibility that the, the last remaining guarantor of the British identity of Northern Protestants is the Dublin government. <laughs> you know, that, 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 you know, with, with, with the way the United Kingdom mm-hmm. is in this sort of very odd state where English nationalism has 
shown that it's completely uninterested in mm. in, in the fate of Northern Protestants. You know, the, the betrayal ha has been stunning, you know, and, and, and open, even by the ERG, you know, the, 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 the most, um, ones who are most uh, mm. closely allied to the DUP, most anxious to wave the Union flag, I'm sure you remember seeing them going and voting, you know, for the deal in the end saying, but we're, we represent English constituencies. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, tough. You know. uh, Scotland's possibly going its own way. But, but the Irish government has perpetual legal obligations because of the Belfast Agreement to, to, to honour and respect the legitimacy of the British tradition in, in, in Ireland, <laughs> in particular in Northern Ireland. And it, it has this unfinished job really of trying to say how do we do that I mean, what, what does that mean you know how you know is it is it just giving some money to build nice build roads or you know cooperate in health services mm -hmm. that sort of stuff is imaginable right people can kind of see that there are economic problems with it but it's you know people it's on a plane of rationality that people can deal with yeah what we can deal with is how do we not just sort of tolerate Protestant union tradition, but but how, how do we actually become the guarantor of it? I mean, you know, how, how do we honor an yes. obligation which we've taken yes. on to say well, we we recognize in perpetuity? So e e e even in a changed political um, dynamic, or even a changed institutional set of arrangements, w we still yes. guarantee your right to your own identity. And yeah. what does that mean politically? You know, how, yeah. how does that get expressed politically? Um, so it's a it, it's it's, it's Perhaps one could argue, um, if it were not for all of the outside changes, which have, I, I think made the case mm -hmm. for dialogue and preparation unanswerable, it, it has to happen simply because stuff is changing. Yeah. If it were not for those, you would almost say, actually, there's a first phase necessary here, which is a, is a real process of self-reflection on the part of Irish nationalism, for want of a better word, Irish national identity, mm -hmm. you know, the way it expresses itself. And what does that constitutional commitment and the commitments of Belfast Agreements actually mean? And if it were to go to a border poll, would it mean a federal Ireland? Would it mean a unitary Ireland? Um, are people in, in the Republic widely um, satisfied that there would be a very different Ireland if there were to be this new Ireland uh, on the other side of a border poll that was successful uh, with a new constitution? New, new political symbolism, all kinds of differences that may be very challenging to uh, to people in the Republic, actually. Um, and probably many people haven't even thought about how that that could be implied in that kind of journey. So, I mean, there's a bit of confusion on both sides of this debate about what, what's on the other side, if, it, if there is another side to that border poll. And we're having this conversation, Fintan, uh, in what is the centenary year. Yeah. For, for Northern Ireland and the political impasse around even commemorations of that centenary year are, are yet another example of this bipolarity we have, these parallel tracks of conversations, identity and, and understandings of the history of this island because there is simply no uh, agreement on this. And, and there was this, I mean, I guess you could, I don't know how you describe the... the the Seamus Heaney role in all of this, you're going to be the official biographer within a few years. Um, Seamus Heaney, in the judgment of one side of our community, being co-opted uh, into the imagery of the Northern Ireland office's centenary uh, publications, branding, uh, and the other side saying, well, well, why, why shouldn't he be there? We celebrate Seamus Heaney as we do Mary Peters and all kinds of other people. It's people from this part of the world that happens to be called Northern Ireland who are great and successful people. And then the other side said, well, why didn't you go to the funeral? Why wasn't there a single Northern Irish Unionist present at the funeral, uh, at the memorial service in Dublin of, of, of Seamus Heaney? So we're, so we're now wrapped Seamus Heaney into in all of this. And maybe it's appropriate that we should do because Seamus Heaney in some ways is a liminal character, isn't he? In, in, in understanding the identity of this island. Yes, uh, you know, I, I mean, I do think it's very unfortunate that he was sort of um, yeah. politicized and that various people were saying what Seamus would have said. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but hang on, this is what he did say. <laughs> yeah, you know, but, like, um, claiming to speak for, for Seamus Heaney, I think, was, 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 uh, was a bit mm. unfortunate. What we do know about him, though, is that he, he tried to keep open a space 
of mm. respect, of, of generosity, of, of trying at least to understand other perspectives. Um, and I'm not for a moment daring to speak for him and say that he, he, he would have been happy to have his image used or whatever. I but, but uh, there, there are two ways of looking at it, aren't there? I mean, one is traditionally it would have been unthinkable for Northern Ireland as an official entity to wish to celebrate itself through, through the next <laughs> month about it, you know, using famous Catholics, you know, was, was not exactly where the, where, where the tradition lay, you know. Um, and so that itself, you, you know, this is again how things might be interpreted in, in very opposite ways still. You know. mm. From one perspective, this is a sort of annexation, uh, which, is, which is unjustified. From another perspective, it could be seen as itself a mark of progress and, and of, of an opening of the mind to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, and these things always involve hypocrisy, you know. Um, if people are going from having relatively closed minds to having relatively open ones, you know, you got to be careful about saying, but but when you when your mind was closed, this is what you were like. You know, you, you have to have <laughs> some kind of space in which they can they can begin themselves to imagine mm -hmm. and think mm -hmm. about um, what their own identity is and what, what it means. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the thing we haven't really talked about with them, but is 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 of course that it, you know. We're talking about unionism and nationalism, but of course the reality is that there's, there's if there is going to, if we're going to mm -hmm. end up with a referendum or if that's where it's heading, it's going to be decided by people who, who do not identify yes. with either of those labels. Mm -hmm. That's right. How are they thinking about the future as you can gather it right now? I don't know uh, about the don't knows and it is the the undecided, the the group you're describing. I don't even know what the right language is. Some people talk about the Northern Irish, uh, the in betweeners. All kinds of language has been used to describe this grouping who are neither uh, strongly unionist, strongly nationalist, but it is the fastest growing section of our population, of course, in terms of and, and of our electorate. And, and it may be that it's connected to um, the declining role of religion in this society, it may be um, connected to an increasing sense of frustration with generational impasses, which is what we live with, of skirmishes over everything, even branding and uh, in adverts. Um, it could be people have just had enough of that. They're exhausted by that and they're in this category. But it doesn't follow uh, that because they're in this category, they're going to go for a United Ireland either. No. It doesn't follow at all. Um, I mean, I've spoken to some people within this category who say, I, I don't want to leave the European Union. And for precisely the same reasons, I don't want to leave the United Kingdom either. Yeah. Because they want to be part of a larger union. Um, and then there are others who say, well, I want, to, I want to leave the United Kingdom reluctantly only because Ireland is the way back into that larger grouping of the European Union. Um, I think when you look at the polling and the surveys, it's just not clear, just not clear how that, that would go if it came to an actual border poll. I mean, it's one thing to sample opinion right now, but if you put a date in the diary, that becomes a very different challenge for someone. And, it, you know, it's, th these are people who have tried in this category we're talking about, these are people who are, are building families and trying to make life work. Or optimistic people or hopeful people want to get beyond traditional divisions. Does it follow from that that they would jump one way or the other on a border poll? It doesn't seem to follow clearly for me. I'm not sure there's any inevitability in that connection. And you know, the the the, the reality is that as you say, you've got this this growing population, which is which is actually in a way the you know, people are very pessimistic about the outcomes of the Belfast Agreement politically for very good reasons. You know, it's incredibly difficult to actually get the institutions to work. Yeah. But the underlying, you know, hope that I remember being people talking about in 1998 was that you would have the emergence of a, an identity that was actually quite, um, quite comfortable with not being binary. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's a trans population. You know, it's, it's the, the non binary yeah. is, is, is really the underlying gesture of that old agreement, you know, the, the mm -hmm. And the fact is you do have a lot of people who are 
or both, you know, mm, yeah. who, who don't wish to think of their identities as being binary anymore. Uh, and the difficulty again is that uh, the, the, on the one side, uh, the settlement, if, uh, well, if it is a settlement, uh, the, the protocol and the post-Brexit situation, uh, actually suggests fluidity. You know, so 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 mm. so what's happening there? Yes, of course, it's integrating the island in in in, in all sorts of ways, and it has a huge implication for the future of the union and its place within it. But socially and economically and culturally, it's sort of saying, you know, you can have a British passport, an Irish passport, you can be in the European Union, outside the European Union. Mm. You know, you can mm. Northern Ireland can be this sort of free space, which is yeah lots of different things at the same you can time. even have the erasmus scheme and, uh, yeah, the, Euro yeah. and the european health card <laughs> yeah and you can get this through the through the irish government without having to you know yes. to, to, to wave the irish flag you, you know so it's it's objectively it's opening up all sorts of possibilities for people not having to think in those terms and yet on the other side you've got this momentum mm. towards the thing about referendums is they're binary you know, this is the yep. brutal, brutal business. That's the brutal fact about that. Yeah. Uh, and they're, they're, they're very unhappy from that point of view. I mean, there was a, of course, there was a precedent, which was the, the devolution referendums in, in, in 1979 in the UK. Didn't just say, you know, it's, it's binary. It said there has to be a given percentage of the entire voting population mm -hmm. voting for, because it was, was 40%, wasn't it? Um, yeah. Which is why the, the devolution um, proposals failed in 79, because they, they passed, uh, but didn't, well, they passed in Scotland, not in Wales, but they didn't pass by enough in Scotland to get the 40% of all possible voters. Mm. That's not envisaged in a border poll, but of course could be. Again, because the, because the Belfast Dream says so little about this, you know, there are all sorts of ways in which you could, you could restructure a referendum, you could think about it differently, you could have different stages of referendum perhaps. And maybe uh, maybe mm. the experience of Brexit pushes us towards um, at least being open to thinking about a political process which is which is eludes the binary for as long as possible and, and, and in as many subtle ways as possible. And I see the arrival of Jerry McKenna on my screen. Hi Jerry. Well thank you. Uh, thank you uh, to our speakers. Uh, Hey, I am Jerry McKenna, Senior Vice President of the Royal Irish Academy and Chair of the Academy's North-South Standing Committee. So we now turn to the questions. We've time for a few questions, very few. You cover most topics uh, as you've gone along. But the first question uh, is, uh, how should the political, social and cultural relationships between Ireland and Britain develop post-Brexit? And could Northern Ireland position itself be pivotal in those relationships? Hmm. How should they or how will they? I mean, I can't predict either. Should, and, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to offer you my, my prescription, uh, but Northern Ireland has been pretty pivotal in the last three or four years. And, and, I, 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 and I guess through principally through the DUP and, and the critics of the DUP will say, look what happened when you're pivotal. And, uh, if you're pivotal, it all depends on what you're driving for. Uh, and we, we, we could have been driving for a softer Brexit that would have avoided some of these things. But no, we went for a harder Brexit. So the crit critics will say that sort of thing. Uh, I, I know that most people I talk to, even within unionism these days, think the future of Northern Ireland within the United Kingdom will be certainly less pivotal, more marginalized, less important, less, less of a voice. Uh, and and with, they would regret that, in fact. But what they've seen really with the Brexit experience is a Northern Ireland that can be useful, but can also be dispatched to a protocol when it when it suits uh, the rising ambitions of English nationalism. So there is that view within even unionism, not just uh, more generally. So I would I would not say that we're looking to see a a very pivotal politically a very pivotal Northern Ireland in the future, um, the foreseeable future in terms of UK politics. EU politics and the Republic, maybe a different question. Yes, I, I, I would agree with that, actually. You know, it, it, again, it is ironic, you know, I, I, I completely agree with William that 
Northern Ireland's place in the in the UK has, I mean, has been very brutally um, marginalised, you know, and and this is this has huge implications. But one of the forces that will keep Northern Ireland on on various agendas is is the Irish government, which which simply has to do so. It doesn't have a choice about this, you know. It's a very mm. interest, and has to do so by rebuilding its own relationship with with the British government. Um, the the this has been a very difficult period, obviously, for Anglo Irish relations. I mean, yeah. certainly most difficult since probably since the early nineteen nineties. You know, since the the peace process stuff really started to to to, to cohere. Um, and there's been a lot of rhetoric. There's been a lot of of, of nastiness. Um, so there's a, there's an enormous interest from the point of view of the Irish government, I think, in 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 settling all of this down and in, in in rebuilding a sense of of, of its of its relationship, mm-hmm. uh, and are beginning to work closely together again in relation to Northern Ireland. Uh, mm. And you know, I I do suspect that there will be enormous attention paid to this because. Apart from anything else, and it's true, of course, of Britain itself and, and of everybody, that the the amount of just bandwidth that's been taken up with Brexit, yeah, you know, it, it 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 has prevented a lot of the thinking that we've been talking about, you know, um, over the last hour. You know, the 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 kind of work that needs to be done, mm-hmm. by and, and 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 the rebuilding of those relationships, but also the attempt to rebuild some sense of common purpose which yeah. really disappeared over over this period mm-hmm. and i think this is in everybody's interest and i i very much hope it will happen a related question is uh, making the case for united ireland or making the case for the union will take on heightened meanings in a divided society and to that extent uh, the stresses brexit has placed on the wider union might be the case that Northern Ireland ends up in purgatory, sandwiched between two unions, the UK and the European Union. How in? Well, Vincent, you, you can offer well, you know, a theological um, view first. Be, being, <laughs> <laughs> we mentioned um, Seamus Heaney earlier, you know, but I mean, one of the great things about Seamus Heaney is that everything is mm. in the middle, you know. Mm. All the all the good stuff happens hovering between states. You know, yeah. you are neither here nor there. A hurry through which everything passes. You know, so that's sort of idea of mm. what you want to be actually is is in an indeterminate state. And it's it's you know Brian Friel, another another sort of ambiguous Northern Ireland person, <laughs> you know, who literally lived on the border, so he could sort of just just the other side of the border. But you know, for for his great line in, in translation, confusion is not an ignoble condition. Yeah, uh, may, may well be where we have to think about this. You know, I, mm. I I think there's a broader picture here, right? Which is which is that we've gone we're, and we are maybe still going through a period of extraordinary upheaval in the democratic world about identity, uh, about you know. Re- re- revisiting, you know, mm-hmm. various forms of ethnic and sectarian and racial nationalism that we thought might might have been put to one side or, or buried. Um, we don't really know how that wave of of the far right is uh, how far that's going to go. Is it receding? It looks like it may well be. I think COVID actually, oddly enough, may have a big part to play in this. I think the mm. the idea of you know taking the risks to wreck your own government, to wreck your own state, mm-hmm. it's quite as good when there's a pandemic on. But I think all of this, you know, we're, we're, we're not isolated from this, you know, we're, we're, we're part of this world. And, and I think one of the things we have to get back to is the idea that for all its faults and all its all the qualifications about how it's worked, the Belfast mm-hmm. is an absolutely remarkable international achievement, it matters in terms of how it envisaged belonging in the modern world. And what we need to try to do is when we can kind of mm-hmm. get our heads out of the Brexit hole, you know, is try to start reanimating the potential of that, uh, you know, as a, not just as a little solipsistic thing on this island, but as a sort of humane mm. way of thinking about belonging in the 21st century. Um, and I, I think in that sense, you know, there's ways of thinking about Northern Ireland's 
you know, many, many ambiguities as, as being actually just the leading edge of the way most people's lives are now and, mm -hmm. and, and pointing us towards the absolute need to find ways to accommodate those differences and, and, and make them rich rather than making them into forces of destruction, which has been so much over the last few years. I can't add to that. Next question. Uh, is the paradox not that any unionist analyzing sensibly the lessons of the Brexit referendum for a border poll understands that we need to think through the implications of constitutional change to the nth degree? Yet the same people shout Lundy and Judas to any unionist engaging in that debate. Hmm. I think there is a recognition that you need you need to think carefully about um, constitutional change, and you know, be careful what you wish for in every kind of constitutional referendum. Be careful what you wish for is a pretty good piece of advice, no matter what your political perspective. Um, I, I see where the person's coming from. I don't, I'm not hearing. The DUP, for example, shouting Lundy at people who simply want to have a conversation. Uh, and, and the DUP does privately. DUP members and politicians do have conversations privately. Um, of course, that's always gone on with all of our parties. Um, but I think from a strategic point of view, I can understand why they don't want to add momentum to a conversation that might lead them to a conclusion ideologically that is completely out with their own ambitions. I would wonder whether there's a possibility, and this is slightly pushing out the boat, maybe being too optimistic, but we really need to reshape the conversation. Actually, we don't have a conversation. Let's, you know, and I think William's been very honest and very clear about this. I mean, very few people from a unionist background are really particularly anxious to engage, and it's particularly from the unionist political community. Hmm. Perhaps a way of thinking about this is that we need to say this is not just about the the island of Ireland. You know, the real conversation is about what does the political architecture of this archipelago look like in twenty years' time, or fifteen years' time, or ten years' time? Mm. Because whether you like it or not, that architecture is changing. Yeah, you have a vital interest in this, and maybe thinking about it, you know. From a unionist perspective, you, it might be more comfortable actually thinking about it as the future of these islands, because there's no question in my mind that e e even if you're an Irish nationalist, which I am of a certain kind, um, what happens in Scotland, for example, is 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 absolutely crucial to to, to the future of this debate. What the, what the nature of an Irish solution would be cannot be considered in isolation from 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 what's happening on the neighbourhood. Mm. So, so maybe part of the project is, is actually opening up a broader dialogue, which perhaps some of political unionism might be happy to be involved with, you know, which, which is, a, you know, reanimating the idea that's supposed to be there in Belfast Green is never really meant very much about the Council of the Islands, but, you know, having, having frameworks in which we can talk about what, mm -hmm. what it looks like, because it's, it, it has already changed. I mean, Brexit has already altered the political geography of these islands and it, so even if nothing else were happening even if we weren't thinking about a border poll we would need to start having these conversations and the language you use is very interesting and very important there isn't it Vinton uh, a language uh, shaped by neighborliness uh, by peaceable friendships uh, by cooperation that, that, that's that shouldn't be terribly challenging language and one hears unionists using language of uh, about neighbours, our neighbours. Um, obviously, that not the kind of language one one might engage in if one were pushing much further than that constitutionally. Um, but there is certainly the potential there, certainly, isn't there, uh, for cooperation between Britain and and Europe and between Northern Ireland, the Republic, and and the, this archipelago, as you say. Uh, and why should that be a threat to anybody? It doesn't have to be a threat. The language you use to describe that ambition will determine whether it is a threat. Yeah. A more grounded question. What are the key barriers to developing an efficient, cooperative, cost-effective all-island health service? <laughs> I wish I were a health economist at this point. <laughs> well, let me, let me take that because this is actually a really interesting question in itself, but also in terms of the broader uh, dialogue mm. that we've been trying to engage in. 
because one way in which as a as a southern social democrat i would very much welcome a northern takeover of, of the republic would be the creation of an all ireland's national health service you know um the big problem i, I know there are huge problems with the nhs with the funding of the nhs mm. with the privatization but there's a whole set of questions but the basic structure the basic principle of the nhs is one of the great divides between north and south the south has experienced this uh this this um uh, the, the, sorry, the North has, has experienced historically what it's like to have a public a public dominated health service, whereas the South has mm. Not. Mm. It's a completely different historical structure in terms of what, what a health service should look like. And it's one mm. which is unsustainable. The pandemic yeah. is very, very interesting in, in, in this regard. Neither mm. part of the island is covering itself in glory at the moment. No. But it's it's brought home. If there's one thing that's going to come out of the pandemic, I think it's thinking about public health and about health as a public good rather than a than a private commodity. Mm-hmm. South has a much much larger um, involvement with, uh, with with the, with the private sector. Completely obvious open health health service apartheid. You know where fifty percent of the population has has private health insurance um, and. Um, one of the things we should be thinking about actually is almost retrofitting the, the health service of, of the Republic um, onto at least what the NHS is supposed to be. I don't know if that makes sense to you. It does, yeah. It's interesting, this always comes up as a major issue when, when we talk about border poles um, here in Northern Ireland, um, about how do we protect what we have? How do we protect the, the NHS being a very good example? of what we have uh, and other things as well, but t- principally the, the the health service here. And uh, and of course, some on the other side of that argument will say, well, we're already doing lots of cooperation. Why don't we just build on that cooperation? We're already doing lots of cross-border uh, health work. We are, uh, and we're, we're sharing resources, sometimes sharing ambulance uh, recently, haven't we? Um, but how do you fund something like an all island health service? Or how do you fund something for the rest of Ireland that looks like what we have in Northern Ireland? It's very interesting. We have this sort of subvention mindset at times in, in Northern Ireland. We're, we're wondering who's going to pay that bill. Um, if it's not the British Exchequer, it can't be Dublin because you haven't got the money, right? So who's going to pay that bill? And many economists will say you need to lose that mindset. You need to stop thinking about some political granddaddy figure who's going to sign your checks. Um, we've got to find a way to make our way in the world and to mature economically. Final uh, question, and it requires a very quick answer. But it, <laughs> relates, uh, it relates to what we've been talking about. Uh, if Northern Ireland voted for unity, how would the people of the Republic react, given the massive disruption the life and institutions in the Republic, including the huge economic cost of the Republic, selling point in the South would be nationalist romantic ideals. Would the latter prevail? If the Republic voted no, how would you deal with the resulting mess? You could have a situation where the North voted yes and the South voted no. <laughs> mm. And you could, you know, it's, it's yeah, not, you not unthinkable. Yeah. Um, and this comes down, I think, to what William was saying earlier, you know, about how it's one thing to think about it in the abstract. It's another thing when the actual proposition is on the ballot paper mm-hmm. and when it's backed by, as it would have to be, by a Scottish style 950 page, you know, documents about what this means for your health service, what this means for your taxes. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's one of the reasons why this, the, the intellectual effort really needs to go into thinking all of this through. Because Sinn Féin, even, for example, talks about a border poll. It's not a border poll. You know? There's just two polls. There's two mm-hmm. entities here who have to vote. <clears throat> and um, people would point to it and say, but look, if you, if you look at 83% of people or whatever in, in the South say they want to imagine Ireland, 83% of people in the South say that they absolutely love the Irish language and, and would love to speak it more, but unfortunately haven't got around <laughs> to it. You know, there's a big difference between what you think you should want mm, mm. and what you do emotionally want. And I'm genuine, I'm not, I'm not serious. Yes. It's very real. Yeah. But, but, you know, what does, what 
that you got to do in your own life that that's going to make that happen and, and and think about what those consequences are as someone who's overweight i know exactly what you mean <laughs> <laughs> regrettably these are all the questions we can deal with this evening there are many questions unanswered and i'm sure the debate and the discussion will go on in in other fora uh for a very considerable time so a sincere thank you to Fintan and william and to all of you for the question i'm sure everyone will agree that this was a most enjoyable an interesting academy discourse. I would like to thank our sponsors, Mason, Hayes and Curran, for their support, and thank the Secretary of the Academy, Pat Shannon, for organizing the Academy's discourse program. The next Academy discourse will be on brain mechanisms underlying flexible navigation. <laughs> the <Asian> neuroscientist, <laughs> Nobel laureate, John O'Keefe, an honorary member of the Royal Irish Academy. This will take place online on Thursday, the 18th of February at 7 p.m. Further information and booking details are available on the Royal Irish Academy website, www.ria.ie. So I hope that you'll be able to join us then. In the meantime, that you stay safe. Good night. <laughs>